Okay. Um, I, I, I really want to work a little bit more on, well, not a little bit more, but I want to work more on uh, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Um, but, but since I talked Thursday night on, and I hope everyone actually understood what I was saying, talking on the garden, how that, you know, Adam was, um, put out of a relationship with God or, or, or put out of the garden relationship, we might say. And now least man put forth his hand and eat of the tree of life and live. Passing through the two cherubims and the flaming sword, it turns in every direction. I was just stressing that that indicates that we would have to get back in a garden condition with God I don't know how many people realize that that Adam was in the garden, or, or maybe not realize. I think he probably realized that he didn't reach perfection, but he was in the garden um, in a sinless condition for some time. Um, I related that to show how Jesus never committed a sin. He was in a garden condition with God. <laughs> I'm using that to show that um, that the garden condition is the same as second heaven. Of course, we've always taught that, that outer courts of the tabernacle is first heaven. The second heaven is the holy place, and third heaven is holy of holies. Um, I'm... I'm you know, I had somebody ask me recently, I'm just going over a few little things before I go any further. Um, if you can slip in and out of the garden, some men think you got the Holy Ghost in the, I, I'm not in the garden, in, in the holy place, same thing, but in the holy place is how they've used it. Um, there is a scripture where Paul, so speaking of himself, when he said, I know of a man about 14 years, uh, rather in the body, out of the body, I cannot tell such one is caught up into second heaven unto third heaven, or in, caught up into paradise, which would be the same as Eden or, or holy place or second heaven. And he heard words unlawful to speak. I don't think that he necessarily slipped into that. Uh, I don't think it's a place where anybody can just go, oh, okay. you know, uh, have an experience in. But it does look like that um, at, at that time that Paul was granted an insight, but what he heard was unlawful. He couldn't speak it. And he was a special called of God. So uh, that's the only place that I can see where anyone may have got in a second heaven condition momentarily and then maybe got back out of it. He may not have been um, in a place where he could stay there. He was caught unto third heaven. He got into, into the holy place. But there wasn't a place made yet for the Holy of Holies. Paul mentioned in, in uh, let, me, let me add these, we still got people coming in. They have. Certainly a lot of people was able to come today that wouldn't have been able to come any other way, but I hated not having regular physical service. Anyway, so let me get back. Um, Um, and, and basically what my point is here, if you didn't get it Thursday night, is that I still maintain that you cannot 
reach perfection or overcome come outside of a restored church. Um, and I think what I'm what I've been talking on, I think actually proves that. Um, but I want to give you, um, I want to finish up here today with that while it's on your minds fresh. Um, uh, I referred to Joel to Eden. The Eden was before the early church, desolate wilderness behind them, the fallen way church. Um, and, uh, uh, showing that there, you know, there'd never been a people like them and never will be for many generations, indicating that would be us in a restored church, that there would be a people like that. Again, I think everybody needs to make sure you understand this, is that let's just, let's just take the early church for an example. It'll be the same in the, in the latter house, our restored church. But Second heaven was available on the day of Pentecost, but I don't think anybody was able to enter it. You got to qualify to get in second heaven, to get in the garden, pass through the flaming sword, which is the word of God that turns in every direction. It'll judge you for everything. God's going to judge his children for every deed. Um, and so um, and, and that don't mean he's going to punish you for every deed. It just means that he's going to put you through a process of judgment and you're, you're going to have to overcome any deed. Uh, see, I've used this before that how the Bible says that your sins would be put in the sea of forgetfulness. Well, that just means your sins are forgotten as far as judgment's concerned. That is, God's not going to hold that against you for judgment once you repent of a sin, our sins. But God, he hasn't forgot it. <laughs> he can't forget it because he's got to deal with you to overcome whatever it was it causes you to do these things. Or maybe I should say me, if that sounds too offensive for me to say you, but you know, but in other words, God has to visit whatever's in our minds and what era is in our character to correct that. And so um, that was my point for bringing up the garden, the garden of Eden, paradise, and the holy place. Oh. Uh, I don't think we probably won't have time here today, but we could go through the ninth and tenth chapter of Hebrews where Paul deals with the holy place, the natural and the spiritual uh, holy place, and, and shows that you could not be perfected in, under the old covenant or the uh, natural, literal holy place or tabernacle. But it would take the the that that was made without hands. That is that Christ became our high priest. Um, let, me, let me say something about him. Christ, since there, since the holy place is symbolic or allegorical concerning um, the. Uh, the condition or picture that the natural tabernacle shows, then when you're looking in the in the holy place, you're looking at a uh, candle, a candle with seven sevenfold candle that is a sevenfold light, and the twelve loaves of unleavened bread, which is a picture of the bread is a picture of the word of God. It's unleavened. It doesn't have any falsehood in it. You know, Jesus told his disciples, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. We can't have any leaven in, in the word of God. It has to be unleavened or absolutely true. Um, the seven spirits of God 
that are uh, in the candlestick. It's a picture of, of the Spirit of God anointing or revealing the truth of the Word of God to you where it enters your understanding. And you actually see it in a sevenfold manner in, a, in the Holy, in the early church. Again, no one could enter into the holy place unless they had went through the process of qualifying to where they have achieved a place where they have the power to live above sin. And when they entered the holy place, again, I mentioned Adam was in the holy place and was not perfect without sin until he did sin. And then he, of course, was eternally judged unworthy of life. Jesus lived in the holy place or the garden, lived above sin. Uh, he had the power to live above sin. He achieved that place, but it, he wasn't perfect. He wasn't perfect even though he was, a, was sinless. He still had to go through a process where God could perfect him in that power of living above sin. So, and that's, that is a point that I'm making. Okay, so y'all feel free and you ask questions if you've got any questions. I just, uh, I, I'm a little bit fearful. I'm gonna be honest with you that I'm picking up from several brethren that are not necessarily the, um, the elder brethren. However, I can't dis I can't not include some because I've talked to some pretty elder brethren that have seemed like to me lessened our 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 position on perfection. I had one brother tell me that it's not as serious as we have made it. It's not as stringent as we've made it. I'm, that troubles me somewhat. Um, anyway, so <clears throat> um, we're um, so since it's fresh on your mind that I made these statements, I wanted to continue with um, stating something about the last prophetical hour, the last fifteen years or the last prophetical hour that um, is where the church is restored because it goes along with this uh, line of thought that in, that in that restored church of the last prophetical hour is where you can be perfected. So uh, I'm going to, I am going to screen share that. So I'm going to go to screen share at this time. Uh, and just go to some verses there that um, starting with, <clears throat> I guess I could start actually in 1 Thessalonians 4. And y'all know these scriptures, Just is, we're just going to rehearse them here today. And like I said, I probably would have talked more on along the line of where I've been on meekness and, and uh, humility, the, those that mourn and meekness and going on through those steps. But I thought since it's fresh in your mind, I could finish this up um, because it's there's a little bit more um, that I think solidifies the thought. So in 1 Thessalonians 4 and um, Airways telling them, Okay. Okay, in the 15th verse here, it says, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from, sin, descend from heaven with a shout, a voice of the archangel, and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Okay, so here 
uh, I am calling that the last trumpet, the seventh trumpet, because that is when uh, there will be. Can y'all see those ads that pop up on my screen? Do y'all see that? Yeah, you can, huh? I, I got to figure out how to get rid of that. We're going to quit doing that. Anyway, <clears throat> so then we which are alive and remain should be caught up together with them in the clouds. That's the restored church are the cloud of witnesses of the faithful overcomers <clears throat> to meet the Lord in the air. Um, I just think that that's just like using this statement of the prince of the power of the air. In other words, that that's present. Uh, when the Lord comes and catch it, not catches us up actually into heaven, which is eternal life, um, but uh, but it's a restored church, this place in the last prophetical hour that we'll caught up. And so shall we ever be with the Lord, I think, because uh, I think we're caught up into that place. We will um, uh, we'll, we will overcome sin. That's a reading that for the resurrect, that resurrection of the just. Okay, so now I want to go to Revelations um, the 11th chapter. And the reason I'm going to this 11th chapter of the book of Revelations is because that's this is where the seventh angel sounds right here. The seventh angel sounded. In fact, I'm gonna highlight that for the underline. Okay. So this is when the seventh trumpet blows. Um, so we've already been through. We were in the sixth trumpet up until we got in the 11th chapter. Here, if we back up to the 13th verse, these two witnesses that lay dead in the streets for three and a half days, after three and a half days, and I, at verse 11 here I'm on, at the spirit of the life of life from God entered into them and they stood up on their feet. That is when the Reformation started. Up until then, we were in the, um, we were still in the, uh, in other words, the two, two witnesses were still laying dead in the streets in the uh, period of Catholicism where the rider of the horse was death and well followed with it, with him. Okay, but here when the Reformation started, God began to anoint men like Martin Luther, men even before him, like I've mentioned, Huss, Wycliffe, other men like that. Um, and um, so they, they, they got an anointing and the two witnesses came alive and stood up on their feet, so to speak, the Old and New Testament. And the same hour was there, there was a great earthquake and the 10th part of the city fell. And in the earthquake were slain a man, 7,000 remnant were frightened and gave glory to God of heaven. I don't have anything on the 10th part of the city other than 10 represents judgment and so when this earthquake went, went, the judgment, our government, which I'm saying this earthquake is the fall of America, and the judgment of America is going to fall. Um, that, you know, I could say more on that, but I won't for right now. But um, I'm going to show you for right here in the 11th chapter, if we go back, to Revelations chapter six. Um, right here in verse 12. And the sixth seal, when this sixth seal opens, lo, there was a great earthquake. The sun became black as sackcloth of hair and the moon became as blood and the stars of heaven fell into the earth, even as a fig tree cast for, casteth her untimely figs, and she sh is shaken of a mighty wind. That was that earthquake. 
I, I'm telling you, that's the same earthquake as in Revelations 11. The reason being is, is just remember what I've told you, that each of these seals are just synoptic pieces of information that just give you a little bit. And, you know, it, they're in chronological order. The white horse, the red horse, the black horse, the pale horse, the souls under the altar, those were the martyrs under the Catholic Church. And then, um, then the sixth seal. And this is, this is when the church is restored. The church is restored here at this time of this earthquake. This two-horned beast is going to make an image to the beast. But if you read on down just a little bit here, and the verse 15, and the kings of the earth and great men and rich, rich men and the chief captains and mighty men, every bond man, every free man hid themselves in dens and in rocks of the mountains and set into the mountains and rocks. Mountains is religious elements, religious groups and rocks fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb. So for the great day of his wrath is come and who shall be able to stand. That great day there is the day of the Lord, uh, which is the 30 year and 15 year period. But the 15 year period basically is what he's referring to in the day of the Lord that God in his day, in the day of the Lord, he will judge everything. The, the judgment seat of Christ will be set up. So I'm just saying to you that uh, this earthquake is the same, and it refers to the last prophetical hour. If you go on in the seventh chapter, this is where he, he seals his servants in their foreheads and makes up his bride, and he won't hurt the earth sea or any tree until he accomplishes that. So it's, again, these are synoptic pieces of information, but when you get over in the 11th chapter, you're dealing with the seventh seal, which opens up the entire book and all of the details of it from the eighth chapter on to the end of the book. So, you know, where he starts all over, beginning to show from the day of Pentecost, the white horse, all the way down in chronological order, showing uh, details of what's given in synoptic information of the first six seals. That's what the seventh seal does. So that's why I'm showing you when we get down to the 11th chapter, he, he finally gets to the seventh seal. And from the seventh seal, um, from the seventh seal, he, um, Uh, begins to show the last prophetical hour, and that opens in the 11th chapter, and it never closes. Each one of these trumpets, this is the seventh trumpet, each seal that opens, that seal remains open till the next seal opens and gives more information. Every trumpet, which is a trumpet message, Every trumpet opens and it stays open until the next trumpet opens, till the God gives the next message and they're given in chronological order. And so in the 11th chapter here, the, the, the um, last prophetical hour, the last trumpet is blown. Uh, doesn't it say that? Let's see. Yes. Fair and 15th verse, and the seventh angel sounded. So here this hour was this earthquake. That's in the last prophetical hour. It's during the seventh, the, the seventh angel sounds. So uh, let's, okay. So the seventh trumpet equals the last prophetical hour. Now let's go to Revelations, uh, Revelations 14 and 7. <clears throat> Okay, and here it is. Now it starts off in the sixth, the sixth chapter. Remember, we're we're still in, we're we're gonna remain in it. 
we're in the last prophetical hour. We're in the seventh trumpet. Is that, I hope I'm making reasonable sense to y'all because I know I've studied this book so much that it comes easy for me to talk about, but I understand that people really haven't delved into it as much as I have, that it, I may be shooting over their head. I'm hoping I'm making reasonable sense to you. Uh, that's why, you know, I definitely want y'all to ask questions if you got any. Okay. So here in the 14th chapter, it first starts off with the first, with the 144,000 that's made up in the early church, which is a portion of the bride. He just he just starts off there and shows that, that the early church was able to produce that. And then, um, and it, it seems kind of strange because the Gentile portion of the bride is made up in the seventh chapter. It sounds funny when you say that because you say, well, okay, here the seventh chapter, the Gentile bride makes up, and it's not until the 14th chapter that the Jewish ministry produced the portion of the bride that was made up in the early church. Again, the reason for that is, is because in the seventh chapter, that's in the seventh seal, and that's just a synoptic piece of information that we'll see later in the latter part of the book of Revelation of the bride being made up, but it's just dealing with a synoptic piece of information. When you get down here in the 14th chapter, he's revealing more detail that the, there was a portion of the bride made up. And then in the sixth chapter, I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give him glory for the hour of his judgment is come. See, it is that last prophetical hour. It is that, it's the last prophetical hour that his eternal judgment is going to be made manifest in the end of the Gentile world. And there's going to be a ministry right here having another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel. See, we don't have that in its completeness today. We got a lot of truth, but we don't have the gospel that will last forever. No, nothing will be done away with the absolute truth of the word of God that we'll get in the 12 loaves of unleavened bread once we enter into a restored church, which has Second heaven, the garden, paradise, or the holy place available to us when you qualify to enter it. Everybody got to go through a process that depends on when. Let me, uh, let me look right quick for you in 1 Corinthians 15. Um, I'm wanting a scripture. I'm pretty sure it's here in the 15th chapter where it says that every man will be, basically it's saying he'd be made perfect in his own order. Right here, the 21st, 20, okay, let's look in verse 22. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. That all means everyone that God has answered the call of God. I don't mean all. It don't mean every ungodly person. It, it means all. And you just have to understand that about the Bible. It's the way it's written. 
that it's all that respond to God's calling. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. Then cometh the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put all down all rule and authority and power, for he must reign to put all enemies under his feet, and the last of to be destroyed is death. So what I was saying was in in every man in his own order, that's what I'm saying about the fact that the holy place, the Garden of Eden condition, paradise, second heaven, was available. It was, heaven was open. It was available. Um, it was available continually until, um, but, but that you had to qualify to get in it. You, you couldn't just go into second heaven just because it's available. Kind of like the president's office. You, you, you can't just march up there and walk in. You're going to have to, you're going to have for some way or another have permission to get in there. You know, it's a crude illustration, but anyway, it's, it's, it's a point across. Okay. So here, here the church is restored and the last prophetical hour uh, comes and the seventh and it's the seventh trumpet. Um, I mentioned right down here. Um, wait just a minute. Maybe let me go back to the 11th chapter. I'm not right here where it's talking about the nations are angry after the second trumpet blows here and the time of the dead that they, well, let me, let me read a little bit more just so y'all know what I'm saying. The second woes passed. That's this earthquake. That's America following. The third woe cometh quickly, which is Armageddon. The seventh angel sounded, there were great voices in heaven saying, kings of this world have become the kings of our Lord and his Christ, and he'll reign forever and ever. Christ finally becomes the rider of the white horse again. He is finally given the position of power. He's finally obtained power over the world again during the, the last prophetical hour, the last trumpet. And the four and twenty elders which sat before God on their seats fell on their faces, worshiped God, saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and was and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged, that thou shouldest give reward to thy servants, the prophets to the saints and them that fear not thy name, small and great, and should destroy them that destroy the earth. Here's the part I wanted to get to. And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament, and there were lightnings and voices, thunderings and earthquake and great hail. That is, that is a judgment. And the temple had been closed until this last prophetical hour. And the temple of God's opened. And there was seen in the temple the ark of his testament. So Jesus, uh, I mean, so eternal life is available again through the go to you go through the holy place, and then you can enter into the holy of holies. So that's been closed, but when the church is restored. That's when these things take place in the last prophetical hour. Um, I think these are very vital pieces of information that sustain what we've always believed about perfection and a restored church. We've had men like Brother Leninger and many men before him that absolutely taught it to take a restored church to overcome sin. But that message is quickly eroding in 
in the body of Christ from what I'm hearing. As a matter of fact, most men rise up against me every time I talk on it, but I ain't done talking on it. I'm not giving in to that because not until somebody gives me some help with these scriptures. Um, okay, so let me get back to where we were in, uh, let me go back to the 14th chapter. Okay, the hour of his judgment has come. Let me see. Yeah, the seventh verse, I think, is what I'm wanting to go. No, that's where it is. What happened to my note that I had there? Seventeen twelve. Let me add that if y'all don't mind holding on a second. Okay, now chap now we're going to go to the 17th chapter in the 12th verse. <clears throat> okay, now here, um, you know, right here, uh, the angel goes back and shows John, said, now I'm going to show you something. Let me, let me back up just a little bit and give you a little bit of backdrop. Uh, in the 14th chapter, it's 11th chapter, there is the seventh angel blows the trumpet. That's 11th chapter. 12th chapter, it goes back to the day of Pentecost and shows the war in heaven uh, in the early church of Christ and his army against the dragon and his army. And, that, and that the dragon is cast out of heaven and goes to make war with the remnant of her seed, which is us. Okay, he starts back there to show what happened and why this dragon is going to be against us. Doing that in the 12th chapter. 13th chapter, he continues that showing the, he stood on the sand of the sea and he saw a seven horned beast come up out of the sea, having seven heads and 10 horns. He's showing who this dragon is, which is Rome. He, in, in the 13th chapter, he's showing Rome and then he's showing that he rules over the whole world for 1260 years in the Gentile world. And then there's a two horned beast that builds an image to the beast. So he drops back to the day of Pentecost to add more information and details to what he's been telling in areas that he hasn't gave details in yet. So I, that takes place in the 13th chapter shows the, the mark of the beast, you know, uh, the number of the beast, 777. Uh, then um, in, um, let's see, where are we at here? We're in the 13th chapter. Okay, in the 14th chapter, he begins to show the, uh, he's starting to show the harvest in the end of the world. See, we're, we're, we're in that last prophetical hour, so he starts showing how that uh, there's going to be a ministry flying in the midst of heaven, and it's going to have three messages: fear God, give Him glory. Don't take the mark. Of, let's see. Don't take the. Um, let's see. Fear God and give Him glory. Babylon's fallen, and don't take the mark of the beast or his image. So he's continuing information there. In the 14th chapter, then in the 15th chapter, begins to tell about the last, uh, the last, the seven vows in the last prophetical hour. There's seven judgments that's going to completely judge the Gentile world. And so he goes into that in the 15th and 16th chapter. Then when he gets here to the 17th chapter, he starts saying, um, 
Now I'm going to explain to you about this woman that was riding this scarlet colored beast. And he shows you that her name is Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. And he reveals that about her. And then he continues. He continues on how she's committed going fornication with kings of the earth and her judgment, the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, the heavens of the earth been made drunk in the wine of her fornication. Um, so God began to show John that this was mystery Babylon the great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And she saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when he saw her, I wondered with great uh, admiration. Well, this is talking about the the image of the beast that's set up in that last prophetical hour. He's going on to explain that and give more details of it. Then he shows here in the eighth verse, said the beast that thou sawest was and is not. Okay, that was, that was Rome, pagan Rome, and it was judged. Uh, it, it lost its power after 1260 years. And it shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundations of the world when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. And here's the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains. These are heads on the beast on which the woman sitteth. And there are seven kings, five are fallen. That's Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Media, Persia, and Greece. Let's see, let me let this person in. And one is, okay? So that's wrong. That's the one that is. And another is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. Let me just take just a moment to say something about that. If y'all remember, Brother Leninger began to teach after he began to see that how we always taught that the sixth head of the beast was pagan Rome, the seventh head was papal Rome. And he said, we've got that wrong. The sixth head is Rome, and it's the same head that's pag pagan Rome. Uh, I've used how that in Daniel 7 or Daniel 2, the two legs of iron, is it's the same uh, material. It's just like me to Persia was all brass, uh, wait a minute, silver. It was all silver. Me to Persia was silver. There's two nations, but they were silver, but they were the same dragon. They were the same head. In Rome, there's two legs. They're both iron. It's still Rome. It just changed rulership from, from, from the civil power of the Caesars to, to the Pope of Rome. Notice what it says here, right here, where it says, um, right here, uh, there's seven heads, which is, okay, seven kings, five are fallen, that's through Greece. Uh, one is, that's Rome. And the other's not yet come. That's America. Okay. When he cometh, he must continue a short space. See, it'd be hard to call pagan Rome or uh, papacy, pap papal Rome, 1260 years as being a short space. But America's not going to speak as a dragon very long. They'll set up the image of the beast and they will give their power to the beast and he'll become the eighth head. So America will not stay a dragon very long. They'll just continue a short space. And when the beast was and is not, even he is the eighth and is of the seven and goeth into perdition. That, that word perdition means, um, let me see if I can give it to you here. Okay. Here, here. Ruin, goes into ruin, loss, spiritual or eternal, damnable, destruction. So that's what, um, that's what perdition means. 
And that's, you know, that's what's going to happen to the B system. And the 10 horns which thou sawest are 10 kings which have received no kingdom as yet, but received the power of kings one hour with the beast. So I'm just showing you in the last prophetical hour, these 10 kings are going to agree with the papacy, the ape head, and then they will destroy it and they will become, they will receive power during that last prophetic hour. So I'm just showing you what's going to happen during this last prophetical hour, and I'm showing you in how it's given to us in chronological order. Okay, then Revelations 18, 10. Um, okay, if you remember, um, this, this chapter starts out with God saying, come out of her, my people. Strong voice. This is a ministry but it's going to be in the last prophetical hour that we get all of God's people out of Babylon. That has not took place, and it won't take place until this last prophetical hour. Remember, we are started out in the 11th chapter in the seventh trumpet, and we're still in it. It's it that seventh trumpet blows to the end of the book. Okay. Uh, therefore shall her plagues come in one day. See, he's talking about Babylon because God's going to reward her double <clears throat> uh, unto her double according to her works. There shall her plagues, therefore her plagues will come in one day, death and mourning, famine, and she be utterly burned with fire and strong is the Lord who judgeth her. And the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and live deliciously with her, shall bewail her and lament her for her. And when she shall see the smoke of, when they'll see the smoke of her burning, y'all realize how all the countries pretty well in this world honor the Pope of Rome and the Catholic Church, all of our media system. They've committed fornication with that. They accept that religion. They, they uh, hold to that. Uh, and if they're going to talk about anything, it's going to be about Catholicism. Her, they saw her smoke burning, standing far off with the fear of her torment, saying, alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. She will be judged in the last prophetical hour. God will get all his people out of it first. Come out of her, my people, uh, before he gets her out of that, but before he judges that system. Okay, then we'll go to the 17th verse. I could have just went down, but anyway, so, um, and here they're saying, alas, alas, that great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet, decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, for in one hour, so great riches is come to naught that she's, you know, here in this last prophetical hour, God's going to judge this system. I could click on it and it'd take us right down here to this 19th verse. And they cast dust on their heads and cried, weeping and wailing, uh, saying, alas, alas, that great city wherein were made rich, all that had ships in the sea, by reasons of her costliness, for in one hour she is made desolate. Rejoice over her, thou heaven, and you holy apostles and prophets, for God has avenged you on her. Because she's good, she's, you know, that system's brought havoc and great persecution on the church. Okay, that that takes us back to, you know, that link there takes us back to the beginning, the 11th chapter, where the, the seventh trumpet blows. So my point, you know, here to you is I'm just trying to show you all of these things of God's judgment that takes place in the last prophetical hour and that heaven has been closed until the seventh trumpet in the last prophetical hour, and that's when heaven is open. And that's when it's uh, it's possible in the 14th chapter. You know, if you go back to the 14th chapter of Revelations, 
I mean, we were in it, but but um, um, you know, and I was showing you the message is there, and this is during the hour of His judgment. Fear God and give Him glory. Babylon's fallen is fallen, and um, right here, if any man worship the beast in His image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, they'll drink of the, they, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. We, you know, the, the image hadn't even been set up yet. So this has to take place after the image is set up. That's just confirms that I'm telling you, it's in the last prophetical hour that's mentioned up here. Okay, then it says here, now, I've mentioned this before. I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Right, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. That, that is certainly not talking about natural death because natural death, you're not, go, natural, you're not getting blessed in natural death, but it's when you die out to the Lord this is talking about making perfection. Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth, that they may rest from their labors. Remember, there is a rest that we must enter into. That's talking about perfection. And their works do follow them. So why is there a more blessed time? If you can make perfection any time, why would it be more blessed to make it at this time? It's because it's the only time you can make it. That's why it's more blessed to, to die in the Lord. You can, right now, we can be dying out to sins, but we don't, if we don't die into perfection, we haven't ceased from our labors and, and, um, and uh, entered into the rest of the Lord. And then verse 14, I looked and behold, a white cloud and upon the cloud one set like unto the Son of Man, having in his head a crown, golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. There's that cloud. That cloud is that cloud is a, a restored church. Jesus is coming back in, cloud, in the clouds. He's coming back in a restored church to judge his people for the day of the Lord, which we, you know, I think we're already in the 30-year period of it, but we're not in the restored church of the last prophetical hour yet. Another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud and said, thus thrust in thy sickle, for the time has come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So um, so this is happening in the last prophetical hour that God is going to reap the earth and he's going to make up his bride. And then it goes right in. Uh, he's, he's also here. There's another angel come out from the altar. Which hath power over fire. Cried with a loud cry. To him that's, that had the sharp sickle. Saying thrust in thy sharp sickle. And gather the clusters of the vine of the earth. For her grapes are fully ripe. And the angel thrust in his sickle of the earth gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. See, there's two, there's two harvests here. He harvests the church first, and, and then he's going to judge the world. He'll, he, it's going to be gathered into God's great winepress, and the winepress was trodden without the city. Blood came out of the winepress, even into the horses' bridles. It got everything but the church. That's the horse's bridles. It got up to the horse's neck. That's how much, how strong the judgment of God is in the day of the Lord when his wrath is poured out. Um, here, this is actually a quote from Joel 3.13. See, remember I've talked to you on Joel, the second chapter, concerning the early church, how it that early church was made up the bride and Eden was before them, 
in the great wilderness behind them. There'd never been a people like them. Here in the third church of uh, ver chapter of Joel, he says, put in thy sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come ye, get ye down, for the press is full. The fats overflow, for their wickedness is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of the decision valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. And of course, the lights go out. And so um, God is, this is talking about the exact same thing. In the end of the Jewish world, God harvested both the church and the Jewish world. He, he harvested that world in AD 70. And so he's going to do the same thing down here. And we're picking that up in, in Revelations 14 here. So, of course, the 15th, 16th chapter, I told you, is dealing with the seven trumpets, I mean, the seven vials, and those are the seven judgments that are poured out during the last prophetical hour also. God is going to, look, his first, I, I won't go into all this for it, but the first, here's the first seven angels, see, pour out the vials on the wrath of the wrath of God on the earth. The first one out and poured out his vial on the earth. Remember, I told you earth is religion. Earth has to do with religion and, and prophecy in the book of Revelation. And there fell a noise and gr grievous sore upon the men that took the mark of the beast on them that worshiped his image. He didn't judge anybody unto death. They just poured out a sore on them. He just poured out judgment to those people that were taking the mark. God he, he tried to, you know, he's, he's going to show here that he's absolutely against that the beast system, and they're going to run into all kinds of trouble with God's judgment. Second angel, he pours out the vial on the sea, and it became blood because God's going to get everybody, when he resurrects in the restored church, his people out of the sea, then he's going to judge the sea. Everybody that rejects his call to come out of the sea, that's his people, and everybody that rejects him, God will judge the ungodly, and that's the world, the sea. Every living soul in, in, dies in the sea dur during this vial that's poured out during the last, um, and then the third angel is poured up on the rivers and fountains of waters. That's God's people. Those are God's faithful people. But many of them in the body of Christ, as well as in Babylon, are going to turn against the body of Christ. They will absolutely, just exactly the way, same spirit that Paul had, same spirit that many of the Jews had that turned against Christ and against the body of Christ in the early church, there will be many of God's people that are alive there of the rivers and fountains of water of the spirit of God. And God's going to pour out a vial on them. And, and here's what he heard the angel of the water say, thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and was and shall be because thou hast judged this for they have shed the blood of saints and prophets and thou hast given them blood to drink for they are worthy. So God's going to judge even his people that turns against him and joins up with the beast system. You should be able to see that that will happen because it did happen in the early church with the Jewish people. John said, they were not of us. They went out from among us because they were not of us. Had they been of us, they'd have stayed with us. He just showed they didn't really have this deep enough that they could they could commit to the Lord, and so they they fail in the day of temptation or the, in the day of God's judgment. Anyway, I won't go through the rest of the vials. My main point here today was just to finish up Thursday night's talk and to give you maybe drive a nail in my point with the last prophetical hour showing that it's going to take a restored church for us not only to overcome in, but for God to finish his, his work. And uh, so if there's any comments or any questions, I'm certainly open. Let me cough, it's not cold. Yep.
Anybody got any comments or questions? I've always said y'all are such a good students that you get everything. There's never a question about anything I say. <laughs> There's my advertisement. Yes, sir. Do you have you considered that the vaccine mandate, the worldwide vaccine mandate, may be a precursor to the beast speaking? No, I haven't considered that. I, I, uh, I mean, I could certainly see. I think there's several things God's going to do that we're probably not going to realize what He's doing until after the fact, because we don't really see. I mean, it's it. It would be an assumption. Is best about the best we could come up with. That we just have to assume. It. It certainly seems to me like that. That uh, the Lord is um, is in this. I don't think anything happens that God's not aware of and that he's not in control of. Um, I think we'll get through this pandemic, but I think there'll be another trouble right behind it. I think we're in we're in for troubles, troubles, troubles that God's going to bring on this world. He's going to put pressure on his people to get closer to him, and he's going to eventually bring us into judgment um you know the the um this pandemic of course they're saying now if you've done very much reading on it they're saying within possibly a month to three months it'll be turned into an endemic just a in other words they think it's about over they think after Omicron that that it'll probably it's probably going to wane. We're probably going to live with it. Um, the um, it, it, they think that eventually there will be enough people vaccinated uh, that will and enough people got it that are gonna become immune, but you're only immune for a short period of time with this. This is not like, uh, what was it, chicken pox. You could get chicken pox, once you got it, you was immune to it for life. But, uh, or once you got vaccinated for it. And so a lot of people during the chicken pox era, they actually wanted to get chicken pox and get it over with, because they'd be immune. But this, this pandemic's totally different. You can get it over and over and over, as they think. And I mean, certainly people getting it, uh, even vaccinated people. But it is, I mean, I do believe the numbers myself. I think that the numbers are, are true, that people who are not vaccinated are certainly sicker, more people dying. I'm talking about uh, above 90% of everybody that gets it is, is that much worse off. So I think the scientists and medic, med, medical professionals worldwide knows that. I think the, uh, what do we call it, uh, the FDA, I think they took quite a while to actually approve it beyond just an emergency vaccine. It's still the the bottom line to it is is you know the uh, um, you know I don't I I do think the government goes too far if they if they're going to make you get vaccinated. I don't think companies have gone too far. I think any company that wants to can say all my people is going to be vaccinated, or they can find a different job. They got that right if they want to protect their people. I think they have that right. I think every family, every man in his home has that right, you know, to, to make that decision for their family. But still, I don't think, I think that the, um, you know, it, it's certainly something that God has brought on us that's very difficult to handle. And it's forcing governments and authorities of every facet to bring almost undue force on the people. I mean, they're, they're uh, 
where I just read in, uh, where is it, Boston and Washington, D.C. Yesterday, if you weren't vaccinated, you were banned from both cities. I read that yesterday. I thought to myself, how can they ban you from a city if you live there? <laughs> you know, I, I didn't read enough in it to figure out what the particulars were about it. But anyway, it, it looks like that, you know, definitely God is in it. And it's forcing the civil powers. It's forcing the religious powers. It's forcing every authoritative power that there is to take some kind of position. You know, the, the, the leaders in the body of Christ have, have basically took a position that we can't find a way that this is, this is not something that we can't adhere to or cooperate with. Um, but at the same time, you know, Brother Painter's question was, is could it be a forerunner of, um, what was your question on a forerunner of what? Of the beast speaking. Yeah, of the beast speaking. And, and yes, I mean, I'm not thought too much on that, but it's, it's certainly possible because uh, America is going to speak as a dragon. America is right now speaking pretty strong concerning this, this epidemic, this pandemic. Um, so, um, you know, it, I mean, and I do think God's in control. So yeah, it's forcing some, it's forcing something on us. We may not be able to do much more than just assume what it can be, or what God's doing until we have a clear insight on really what he's doing, you know, and, and, and that's probably going to be in eyes that's in the back of our heads instead of in our foreheads. But, but uh, we're, I, I do believe that we're, we are moving close to uh, the end of the Gentile times. And, and uh, like I said, I, I do I'm still giving room that my timetable could be wrong, but right now the best I've got is we're in the 30 year period of the last day of the, of the day of the Lord and the end of the Gentiles. And, and that after 30 years that we'll enter into the month. I mean, yeah, into the hour, I mean, we're in the month. So the last prophetical hour, uh, the last 15 years, which those of you that just coming in late and all, I will post this um, this Zoom meeting on on our WhatsApp. Anyway, I know this is a little bit you know uh, more uh, in depth talk on a deeper thought that went along with Thursday night. That's why I gave it. This, this finishes up what I was saying on Thursday night on this last prophetical hour. So, so those of you that had to come in late for whatever reason, well, um, I will post that for you and you can listen to this recording. All right, any other questions or, or comments? All right, well, um, we started right at 11 o'clock. So I, I, again, I, uh, I'm sorry that we couldn't have a physical service, but it would have been, we would have been crippled a little bit because we had several people. We have people that's got been exposed to COVID. We got people with symptoms that very possibly could be COVID, hadn't been tested yet. We've got, well, we've got several different, we've got other people sick. They couldn't come today. There were several different things that, that uh, along with, uh, you know, I won't say too much about it because I've noticed some of the Canada people have got on here about our weather, you know. Uh, you know, we did get probably maybe even an inch and a half of snow last night. It wasn't cold enough for it to stay frozen on the streets. <laughs> so, uh, but I did add that in because of 
changing from 60 some odd degree weather to 30 some odd degree weather that with all these other things that happen in a rapid change of weather, I know for, uh, for example, I know brother Phil and sister Chelsea were trying to make a decision. Do we want to get Mallory out in this? Um, but that certainly wasn't the only reason that I, I, I changed the zoom today, but we will enter into more colder, you know, weather. I, <laughs> I noticed that by the end of this week, we're going to be in the high 30s during the day and probably freezing of those of at least three nights of the latter part of this week. So that, you know, that's winter to us. And uh, so, but we'll get more uh, acclimated to it. And certainly we'll have church, you know, unless the roads are bad, we'll most always have church. Uh, anyway, God bless all of you. Um, remember the McGowan family. Remember Brother Bill Daniels, Sister Alexander, Brother Weaver. I did go see him this week and prayed for him. Took him a uh, couch that we had in the gymnasium and uh, that uh, Nikki and Sean had given to Kayla and Eli and they found that it wouldn't fit in their apartment when they were here. And so they gave it to the church and I'm, I, I, I knew I was going to give it to the Weavers. We did have the, the dining room has been uh, completely tiled, both men and women's restroom. Uh, the uh, bottom of the stairwell, the northeast stairwell, and the stairwell going up out of the dining room into the sanctuary on the platform side, and the kitchen, the kitchen bathroom, the, the refrigerator room, the washroom, the pantry, everything's been done. Uh, we haven't got the tables back in and we've got it heated up in there to 75 degrees, trying to get that tile warm enough that it's really laying down good, which it, it's doing good. They're going to come back money and finish rolling it and finish uh, sealing the cracks where two tiles fit together. Uh, there, there's some places you just can't prevent it. There's some little cracks there and they have a product they put in there that seals those cracks. So we should be through with it, you know, hopefully Monday, and then we'll get the tables and chairs back and everything put back in its place. We even got tile underneath the stove in the kitchen, but never had tile under it. And so uh, we've, been, we've really been busy getting that done this week, but we certainly wouldn't have been able to have um, breakfast this morning along together with our Bible study if we'd have had it. That's been done. I guess we need to still be praying for Brother Goss, for the Keswick Church, for uh, Mexico, the Dominican Republic. Uh, we are having Brother Luke, Luke Boyer, which is Roger Boyer's son. He's over the churches in St. Mark Haiti. Brother Rogers put him over that, his son, so the Remy is over the church in um, Florida. Um, but in St. Mark, Haiti, there's a great number of churches there that are under Brother Roger Boyer. I, I believe this number I've been, you know, I've, I've heard for some time around 2,500 saints in the St. Mark area of all those churches that brother Luke is over now, really good young man. He's in his thirties. He uh, is getting married to a girl in St. Mark church in one of the St. Mark churches in La Romana in the Dominican Republic. Uh, they made that decision because many of the saints from Haiti can go to his wedding, uh, but they can't, they can't come to America to it. So they wanted us to help them in La Romana to get find you know the means to have a a good wedding and and a place that they could. Haiti still got a lot of danger in it, 
So anyway, there's going to be a wedding on March the 18th, Friday at four o'clock in La Romana for Brother Luke Boyer, Brother Roger Boyer's son. And we are having a meeting. I am, the Dominican Republic will have a meeting Saturday and Sunday, March the 19th and 20th. For, there are several people going. I know Brother and Sister Dave's has already made reservations. Brother and Sister Rowe, Brother and Sister Durham are planning on going. Um, Brother Green in Wichita, Brother James Rivera. Of course, those men work with me. Uh, but there will be many Haitians from America and I'm no doubt many other brethren. So it'll be a fairly large meeting because we'd have 500 or more if it was just our local churches. So I don't know. I'm thinking we could have a word from six to nine, eight, 900 people in that meeting. It'll be a pretty big meeting, I would think. Anyway, anybody listening that might want to be in that meeting, it's that that meeting is going to be the 19th and 20th of March. It'll start in the morning, so they need to get there at least Saturday the 18th. And if they want to be at Brother Luke's wedding, they need to get there probably the 17th because he's getting married at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, so pray for Brother and Sister Weaver. I'm adding them to their prayer list. Uh, of course, a little Mallory. Remember her and the Fisher family with you know their situation with Sister Mallory, Brother Lewis's grandson. The last I heard about Brother Shane Clifford, he has taken another turn for the worse. That was last night. He had taken a turn for the better. Last I heard is he's he's worse. I don't know if there's an, any report today. If anybody knows, you can let me know. Um, I'm sure I'm missing people, but I'm I'm trying. Sister Brenda Ratliff, of course, needs our our prayers. We really don't need her to get COVID. She's in such bad health. She gets it. I don't know if she can. I don't know if she can survive it. Uh, Brother Smith. Uh huh. Um, the latest report on Shane Clifford is he is on an ECMO machine, and um, he is critical but stable. Okay. Okay, thanks for that report. We still need to pray for him for sure. If I was dying with COVID, I'd want people praying for me, wouldn't you? Or with any, if I'm dying with anything. <laughs> I'm wanting to live right now. I've got work to finish that God's working on me and I'm, I don't think he's finished with me yet. At least I'm, I'm hoping he's not finished with me yet. Cause I know I'm not, uh, I don't think I've reached the plateau of where, where I need to be. Brother, brother by, uh, from Canada that works with brother Goss needs our prayers too. Let's remember him. All right. Let's all, uh, let's see. I'll stop sharing. And we can all unmute our microphones and and um, so we our next session will be Thursday night Zoom meeting again and then I certainly plan to see all of you Sunday. Um, looking forward to having our breakfast and uh, Bible study and and regular service um, there at the church this this next Sunday. All right, dear God, blessed Lord, Jesus, help us today. Help us, Lord, with your our many needs. These are sick in their bodies. God, we need your touch. Faithfully trust us. God, help our senses, the body of Christ. During this pandemic, oh God, help us, Lord, to know you in a greater way. You led us in your spirit. God. Oh, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God, each one of the Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
Thank you, Jesus. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord God, Lord God. Thank you, Jesus. It's your people, Mother, Mother Keith Dobson, sick today. Oh, Jesus. Dear Lord, dear Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. For those that haven't been in church, sometimes, Lord God, God, touch them, stir them up. God, bring them back to your fold. Jesus, we pray. Oh, Thank you. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank Hallelujah. You, Hallelujah. Yes. Thank you, All right, everyone. God bless your hearts. Stay warm and uh, be safe. And uh, you know, uh, and have a have a have a good week. It's coming up, and I'll see you Thursday night back here on Zoom. God bless. Stop the recording. Keep forgetting that.